Oh, did YouTube Autoplay bring you here? Well, before you run away, let me remind you of an amazing new shoe brand called Vessi, ladies and gentlemen. Vessi is a new brand that apparently has been making shoes that are 100% waterproof and snowproof. Absolutely amazing for the winter. Remember, I'm from Canada, so if I'm shoveling snow, I need to be wearing Vessis so the absolute cold doesn't sneak into my feetsies. I don't even like wearing boots, and now I don't have to. It comes with a material known as Dymatex, and before you look it up on a controlled substances list, it is actually a dual climate knitting material that keeps you cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And with how breathable it is, I'll be honest with you, I don't even think it should be this waterproof. Sustainably made and vegan, no doubt. So you can absolutely annoy the people around you with how absolutely sustainable your shoes are. But hey, it's absolutely a perk too. You don't want to be destroying the climate while you're keeping your feet nice and dry. They're comfortable, lightweight, and absolutely breathable. Did I remind you about that? The absolute material on it is so comfortable, so light. Sometimes it even feels like the shoe isn't there. That is until I walk through a monsoon. Look, I'm not the biggest man for style, but every once in a while, people look at my shoes and say, damn, that guy's got it going on. Ladies and gentlemen, it keeps me absolutely perfect in all season situations. Like my tires, this thing is perfect for every season of the year. Some of the daily activities in my life involve washing my feet, and now I can keep them absolutely dry as I try to wash my feet with these sneakers on. As you can see, the socks underneath are absolutely dry underneath such massive pressure. And if you want to learn more about Vessi, please go down into the link below. Make sure to use our code for $25 off each pair of Vessi shoes. Free shipping goes to Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and never forget Singapore. That being said, go check out Vessi.com and use our code and our link below. This is the greatest convention you've never heard of. A few weeks ago, I was in California having a good old Christian Minecraft server of a time with some close friends, and I was attending VidCon. Now I say attending because to be real with you, the entire weekend I was incredibly sloshed to remember the entire thing. And as far as the convention went, I think I showed up for like 20 minutes because they had this Fall Guy stand and I absolutely had to be there right, right present to take a photo with it. But like most conventions, I tend not to care too much and use it as an excuse to just hang out with some friends and the community. Usually all of us are just on discords or our own little places so it's a breath of fresh air to actually shake hands in real life and actually touch some grass together hell of a collaboration now that's not the fault of like vidcon the, the event is actually qu handled quite well i mean i think this year they had tiktok sponsoring the event logistically you know planning wise and making sure all the featured content creators are there showing up to the actual event you know all of that's taken care of security as well everything is executed absolutely impeccably and successfully and you know what we can laugh at all the cringe that vidcon provides but i don't think any of us can say that the event is necessarily unsuccessful again it's just a place for the community to come together in Los Angeles and have a good time, share a weekend, and go back to our regular lives. But of course, like every event, a lot of planning and people go just into running and actually managing these things, and it takes months, if not a year at times, to even prep these things well in advance so everything on the day of can go absolutely smoothly. And I guess today the question can be, can and should YouTubers run events? By now, I'm sure some of you have heard about the massive event known as Lightwave, a festival held in Austin, Texas, run by the YouTuber Glink, most notably known for documentaries in the Super Smash community, criticism of OnlyFans, and discovering of homeless people who live in Skid Row. The trailer was uploaded to YouTube June 11, 2022, advertising to the world one of the best interpretations of Burning Man, I guess, except that one was actually well-planned, believe it or not, to grace the influencer scene. Just watching the trailer itself is a complete fever dream. It starts with quick cuts and establishes itself as a convergence of artists and engineers, creators as well, coming together with the furthest corners of the internet. You got to see in the trailer Justin Wang, Destiny, Ariel Pink, and a few others evidenced by a cut in the audio track signifying that even more creators were meant to attend. Don't worry, the original trailer to this day is still up on the actual Lightwave Twitter, showing that creators like Rusty Cage, who by the way never showed up, but you think was invited based on this little trailer, and Lewis Rossman, who had a big ass question mark, who actually did end up attending the actual festival. Although we'll get to that in a bit. 
Honest to God, watching this trailer, I kind of thought it was a bit of a joke, to be real with you, but at the same time, if you're billing something as a trailer, as sort of, you know, the, the actual trailer for your event, I'm going to believe that everything mentioned into it is probably meant to happen, okay? At the end of the day, this is a festival, a convention, that I'm supposed to be excited for. Who am I to really just sit here and, you know, take it not at face value? I mean, the pretentiousness is not lost, however, on some of the commenters in the actual video. One of them is, for someone who is so critical of Los Angeles, you really are fulfilling every stereotype of an LA art doofus here. I miss when you gave out deodorant to Smash players. I don't really know how to feel about this, Glink. I'm interested to see the Ad Internet Historian video on this in about two years. Bruh, this is something I expect to see on one of your Skid Row documentaries. I'm sure this won't end up like Fire Festival or anything like that. I mean, these are just a few little, uh, you know, comments that you started to read on the actual Light Wave trailer. And of course, they weren't really that flattering. But again, what did you actually expect, ladies and gentlemen? Now again, there were people that were genuinely excited for this. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure in amongst those sea of comments there were people, but of course it's not easy to ignore the obvious criticism from the fan base. This was the same kind of stuff that Glink would have definitely covered in one of the Skid Row documentaries that he actually made. Now I guess the first sign of disaster was when one of Greg's own guest mentions, Boogie2988, didn't even hear about the event at all. Coming to you live through the power of the internet, Boogie. Boogie2988, he's gonna be there. So somebody just asked me if I was gonna be at Light Wave ATX in Austin, Texas on June 28th. No, I, I, as far as I know, I was never invited. I checked my email. I don't see a, sing a single email from them. They didn't arrange for me to be flown there or to have a room. I, I have no clue who's organizing this. I am confused shitless as to why there's a there's a trailer for the convention and I mentioned in it and I don't know I don't know why what the actual fuck now immediately people wondered why Greg would say Boogie was coming in this in his own little you know event trailer and of course one could say that the weird you know extremely stretched out JPEG of Boogie pointing the revolver absolutely could have been taken as a complete joke but then of course later on Greg did clarify that uh there was never actually an invite sent to Boogie Boogie was never invited. That was a joke. Okay. I thought it was obvious, but I guess not. And in fact, it seems like it was a very high key one because very few people seem to pick up on it, me included. So I guess we should start talking about what is Lightwave. From the beginning, it was billed as a two-day festival combining the artists, engineers, and philosophers of our time in the new cultural mecca of the United States, known as tax, sorry, Austin, Texas. According to Greg's own words, this was the culmination of the past three months of his life's work. And of course, the culmination of my life's work for the past three months is about to be brought to the light, where they actually quote tweets the trailer. It's tough for me to know how legitimate this claim really is, when in interviews after the event, he claims the actual planning for this event didn't even really materialize until two weeks out, when other, more professional individuals got involved. Whether it be to process business transactions or do something basic like getting, you know, your panelists booked in time. Right up until literally two weeks before the event, I didn't have the venue fully booked. I didn't have the security booked. I didn't have insurance. I didn't have business insurance. I didn't have like a lot of bases covered that I should have, but it was because I essentially had to wait a while to get an LLC made to which all these bookings could be made under. According to the trailer that was posted on YouTube and Twitter, it seemed to be the birthplace of this radical movement, a place to party and a sellout free zone. According to business cards, it was, and I quote, light is neither a particle nor a wave. It is something more complex and not fully understood. As part of a spectrum of perspectives, light wave brings together the artists and engineers of our time to a shared space where their ideas can synthesize into something beautiful. In the merging of these worlds, the energy exchanged creates a connection, and it is in these connections of energy that light emerges. I'm convinced companies like SpaceX don't even refer to light in such a complex way. Clearly, the idea was to again bridge the space between the artists and the engineers of our time, and somehow they can create some mass orgy to create the most beautiful of those two worlds. Or, let's be real, just party, you know, as, as I think it initially was probably going to be. 
Now, one of the things I'm finding here so far is the idea itself is just way too vague. I mean, is it meant to basically be a place where you create panels that will discuss thought-provoking and radical ideas such as right to repair, which I haven't heard of before. What's, I mean, it, 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 listen, let, let's cut the sarcasm. Right to repair is not some new thought-provoking radical idea. It's literally anti-consumerism, okay? A lot of people fight for it. Or do we speak about the dethroning of YouTube while also on YouTube? As if this concept, again, wasn't actually being discussed beforehand, and it actually isn't even practiced by other tech companies who are making alternative platforms for years at this point, like Odyssey, like Rokefin, where this event was also streamed to. But of course, you also heard about platforms like Vidme and whatnot. Maybe it was to discuss monarchies in cities and states. <laughs> what? Okay, let's be honest. I have no idea why artists or engineers needed to come to this event in the first place. The panels that were done could have easily been done in a much more optimal way. And to have a whole convention where you just have these specific panels with these not really radical ideas doesn't make it any more unique than anything you've really seen, you know, before in time. But before we jump to that in question, it was told to the online audience, basically you and me watching right now, who weren't in Austin at all, that this event was to be streamed live on YouTube, Odyssey, Rokefin, right? That's where we were going to watch the event. So we were never, ever given a date whatsoever by Greg, and it was supposed to be meant that way per his own words in the RFC After Hours interview. The date that Greg picked to run this live stream ended up being the, the weekend of VidCon, right? The weekend where most of the social media personalities, if they had to go out to a convention from all over the world, were going to be in Los Angeles, California. A yearly convention, VidCon, by the way, where plenty of social media personalities basically attended as a form of networking. And again, like I said earlier, basically just getting wasted with your friends. VidCon is not something I care much myself to attend. I'm not some large YouTuber that's going to be there as a feature creator anyways. So for me, the kind of nonsense is just hang out with my good friends, have a good time drinking, catching up in California. It's basically a vacation. And when it comes to the actual con, again, like I'll say earlier, we only showed up for like 20 minutes anyways. The only reason you would ever go to VidCon in the first place is if you're getting paid to go to VidCon and you have to do some sort of panel. Like you actually have commitments. If you don't, why the fuck would you drive out to Anaheim when you can go to much better places in Los Angeles. Now again, going back to this whole situation, Greg, in his infinite wisdom, picked this date in particular, right? And when asked about it in interviews, he tells different stories. The original plan was to have it right after VidCon. Originally, the event was planned to be right after VidCon. When did the schedule have to change, like, to during VidCon from before, right? We were planning to co-host it with the Alex Jones premiere and those dates would work best for them. Now, again, swimming through some of these contradictions and various little additions to the story, I myself questioned the intellect of hosting a festival that was attractive to, first off, social media personalities as well, people that were going to attend. So the artists of our time, if you will, and thinking it in any way was a good idea to host this festival on the exact same weekend of VidCon, an event most people were already going to anyways. Maybe there was like a, a window of time where I could have changed it looking back, but I guess I just didn't even think about VidCon at the time or whatever. Realistically, if you expected a turnout from the people in your scene, it might have been smarter to delay the whole thing maybe weeks, months in advance. I even talked to Prox, one of his like, you know, uh, people who handled the, you know, background technicals to it, and he, he also agreed with me as well. It's like releasing a video game on the same week as something like Grand Theft Auto 6. Could you imagine? If you complain no one bought your fucking game, then maybe it's time to start investing in things called mirrors because you got some long looks to be taking if you're making those kind of decisions. Surprisingly, on the day of the actual festival, a stream actually started on Greg's main channel. Now, of course, you can bet after a long drive to Anaheim in the morning that I was not enjoying, I ended up coming back home to my house just to watch this thing on the big screen. Now, at this point, all of our friends were just sitting on the couch watching this whole thing, and I realized that I was personally in the wrong place. I should have dragged my engineer ass all the way to Austin, Texas to attend the meeting of the minds. This is a fucking tragedy. Sadly, it was a missed opportunity, and so I just resorted to watching the YouTube live stream. 
And after about wasting an hour with my friends, thankfully, we all made brief appearances in the eight hour affair. Thanks again to Prox, by the way. Thank you for putting us up there. But on the day of Lightwave, it consisted of four panels. Right to Repair with guest Lewis Rossman, who actually did show up, did his speech, and overall had an actual interesting panel. Lewis is a great content creator, and if you actually watch his content, you'll know he has the clearest, absolute love and passion for Right to Repair, and it shows. Even if you don't care about Right to Repair, Lewis Rossman will make you care. Lewis shows up to the event and later on explained why he actually showed up in a YouTube comment that you can still find posted to this day. According to Lewis Rossman, a benefactor had given a million dollars to his nonprofit and also attended the event and asked that if they attend the event, please come with a little disclaimer that it was likely going to be a bit of a mess. Remember that quote for later, buckos. Since he was in Austin anyways, he decided that this was a stop along the way. According to this comment, he's a simple guy. You give the man seven figures and he'll show up to a psychedelic thing and say hi. Now, remember when we talked about no sellouts? Well, I'm not saying this is indicative of the definition selling out, because honest to God, I hate the term due to the fact of its cloudy definition, but it's a rather interesting cross section to unearth that it's such an convention or a festival, this kind of money would be traded in exchange for what actually appears to be a clear cut favor. We're going to find out later why Lewis Rossman, right to repair, is even brought into the question to begin with. I'm not saying that the trading of any money means that you're immediately selling out, but rather amounts like this being traded clearly show that there's some level of corporate influence. You don't have to charge for tickets like Greg would think. I don't like sellouts. I think IDubs is lame. I think Hassan is lame. I think a lot of these people that are just, in my view, and you can disagree with it, fine, but they're just totally catering to what, whatever what, they think what the, makes, the audience what makes wants them politically. Sellouts. Uh, the kind of like political slants they take, messaging they use, the nature of what they do as being informed by, as a reaction to the culture, to their audience, instead of like actually what, what, are, what I would consider a real artist does is they don't chase trends, they make trends. You know, they're not uh, following, waiting for the approval of the culture, whether it's politically, or artistically to do something. They're just doing something as an expression. But you can exchange money to bring people to speak about topics that can literally influence the larger population. There's a reason people in the social media sphere are called influencers. You can pay them to attend to literally influence your political leanings, your legal reforms, and various cultural points that you want to basically insert into a broader society as a whole. Now, moving on, there was the next panel, which was the discussion of will YouTube be dethroned? An idea that's been discussed millions of times by millions of people around the world and some who already build alternative platforms. Can someone truly leave YouTube? Yeah, they can. Obviously, anybody can upload to any other website. There's clearly other sites available. You just have to be content with the fact that you are losing billions of impressions. If you're comfortable with that, upload to Daily Motion. All of your content can go anywhere else. YouTube can kick you off at any moment. Obviously, that's the deal you make when you actually create an account here. Unless you know how to learn and diversify your platforms and brand, you have no one to blame but yourself. Again, did you really need a whole panel to tell you that? Didn't think so. The next panel was the Artists of the Digital Renaissance, with some pretty big artists as well, such as Ariel Pink, a controversial artist like Negative XP. And uh, hey, at some point, let's be honest, we gotta kick those boring ass engineers off and actually bring in the cool little artists, right? Let's be real, it's not so much a meeting mind, it seems, versus uh, a little engineering and a little artistry and <laughs> a whole lot of no planning. R I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't talking about it is like, is, yeah, it's, it's cheapening it. Cool. Of course, right. I'd rather be doing it. All right, cool. But I'm getting paid for this, at least. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Either way, I came to see you. I think you're cool, whatever. You. <laughs> yeah, 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 whatever. Finally, the last panel was, are there any political solutions? Arguably, this was the most fucking boring panel of them all. People thought Destiny was going to show up until he basically ditched last minute. Destiny was confirmed to show. He told me the day of that he couldn't make it when he said up until that point that he could. And according to Prox, it may have seemed like Destiny could have flipped on a stream and realized maybe it wasn't worth showing up, even though that apparently he was in fact in Austin for the day one of Lightwave stream. Destiny was in Austin when this was going on and he still just, he cut the cord. I think he might've seen the first part 
of the panels and he was like, ah, oh, nah, fuck that, bro. The topic started to veer towards monarchism and a bunch of political bullshit that clearly even the panelists couldn't even digest. And by this point in the night, I was doing shots with the boys and I was plastered so hard off my ass. So honestly, I couldn't even begin to tell you anything past that. You gotta ask Prox or somebody who actually was at the convention. Look, it's a long stream. I'm not gonna be there for the whole few hours, okay? I had shit to do that day. In between all these panels, there were various intermissions, numerous performances filmed at completely brain dead angles and many, and I mean many shots of empty chairs. Roughly after I woke up hours later, after a night of bar hopping with the boys, I was excited to see day two. Was it gonna be streamed only to realize it never ever happened? According to Greg, this was a recorded affair for a documentary he'll be releasing at some point in the near future. I have all the footage from the day two thing that wasn't streamed, but that's gonna be in the uh, docu-series I'm gonna have on YouTube soon. Now shifting to the technicals of the event, this three month long culmination of life's efforts didn't really seem to be ready for the cameras right until the last minute basically. Ice Poseidon stepped in to make sure that the cameras could connect to the Wi-Fi networks and relay the stream locally so that they could send it online until they found out that in the last minute the only camera that they could use was Greg's because believe it or not there were some cabling issues. Surprisingly. I know right? If he wasn't there there wouldn't have been a stream like straight up. And shout out to Prox, by the way, for getting lowballed completely on his pay, and also Uber and Greg's friends around because like security for the panelists, it was also considered an afterthought to have basic transportation. We settled on like 500 bucks for like three days of work. Remember those panels and the little background PowerPoints, the opening of Lightwave where Greg slapped some JPEGs reminding us that the event is not corporate. There ain't no Amazon AWS, no goddamn Microsoft here, ladies and gentlemen. Those PowerPoints were literally made a day before, thanks to Prox again, once again reminding us that this whole event took way less planning than even some of my daily shit posts on this exact website. Greg's like, okay, listen, Prox, could you do these graphics for the presentation? You know, on um, what's behind? I don't know, Greg. You know your vision much more than I do. How am I, why am I trying to do your graphics right now? Why isn't this done? Yeah. As someone who just said like, hey, I want to help you film your documentary and do mainly film stuff, not design your graphics for you for the pre presentation the day before we're doing the event. It was very yeah. clear as soon as I arrived that this was gonna not be as planned out as I thought it was gonna be. It really seems like everything from the planning to the event to the streaming of it to the online audience may have taken months to do, right? Like, I mean, hey, that's what we were told, but realistically, the ball was dropped so much that it seems like the planning phase, while this may have been an idea months in advance, it never really happened, and it was so half-assed at some point that really it gave the impression of this being basically thought up of, like, what, 24, 72 hours in advance at best? In defense of Greg for about a couple minutes, I don't doubt that he was planning this for months, you know, for months in ahead, like maybe, you know, two, two months beforehand, but there was just so many like weird things and like little things I still didn't understand. Even when it came to Greg's expectation, Prox claimed Greg expected somewhere to the ballpark of 300 people attending in person. Greg was telling me that he was expecting at least 300 people, and that's why he had that many chairs and that much stuff. And that was an extreme estimate when you subtract, like, actual staff. Somewhere around 20 people, it seemed, actually attended the event at all. At least from what I saw in the stream and what Prox also mentions. Promotion was successful because, um, well, here we are talking about it now. Now, while me and Greg have different barometers of success in this case, as long as he's happy with it, isn't that all that really matters? Whatever, let's move on a little bit. It's one thing to point out though that the average viewership of Lightwave at its peak on YouTube was somewhere around 100 viewers. Mostly it was below that. Obviously due to a combination of lack of advertising, say for like one YouTube promo trailer, and a complete mismatch in content to Greg's actual community, of course you can expect the low turnout for the online audience. Now, to the best of my abilities, I've shown you what is Lightwave, what happened on the day of, but obviously, you know, and I know, the story doesn't even come close to ending there. Because now it's time to burrow, twist the knife in, and see what Lightwave actually was about, all right? Actually, what it could have been, what it seems to be about. 
Shortly after the festival concluded and I was in Los Angeles just reeling out of the whole VidCon haze, the day of my flight, I called Kino Corner, all right, Greg's roommate and somebody who was co-organizing this event, who told me a few things regarding the corporate financing structure, and while most of that was off the record, I wanted to include this blurb just because shortly after the call, a few people in various Discord communities caught wind that I was going to be making a video and more so a hit piece on this event. Now, on a personal level, I consider that shit really really offensive because I don't make hit pieces. I research and I make the most objective video and take that I can and I leave all those judgments up to you, the viewer. Look, obviously there's a story to these videos, but I want these videos to be more of a repository of information. I'm not gonna kick someone when they're absolutely down. And like I've mentioned, okay, if I haven't mentioned it already, it takes serious balls to run a convention like this or a festival. Even if this wasn't a success in my barometer, at least it actually happened. Regardless of what anybody wants to say about Glink, the actual event happened, which means it's better than all the other YouTuber events that didn't, you know, shit like TanaCon. Obviously, this isn't up there with events like Creator Clash, which took months of planning, months of thought. This was something haphazardly done. But hey, at the end of the day, it did end up happening. So I gotta give credit where credit is due. And it's not just me saying that, it's even the people who worked on the event as well. Another thing in defense of Greg, this was not a thing for him to just get money or fame or whatever the fuck. Like he just wanted to have cool people people talking about cool stuff and I don't think he got any money from it like there was no ticket sales or anything and it takes like big balls to run something like this especially if it's your first time doing an event like this again with Kino I'd leave everything off of the record but in fairness to myself I'll include him simply because if he didn't want to be included and have his name as far away from this train wreck as possible he shouldn't have been mentioning this to everyone in every discord server imaginable talking about it being a hit piece but moving on after speaking with a few guests who were asked to attend and witnessing some leaked DM screenshots between Greg and Kino to the various guests the initial pitch they gave paints a completely different story to the Lightwave Festival. Now before we begin, I do have to preface for the privacy of the whistleblowers, I'm blurring out dates and names to prevent any trace of who leaked what, okay? But on this point, the actual invite seems to be rather copy-pasted between guest to guest. So let's actually read it, okay? Let's actually get through with it. Glink, in April, tells, Hey, you are hereby formally invited to the Kino Film Festival Birthday Bash 2022. On June 27, 29th, you and other respected creators are welcome to join us for a time of fun, festivities, and nothing fucking Following the shenanigans of KitCon, Glink and I decided to run our own little event with only the cool creators, you, and in the best city around, not LA, our home in Austin, Texas will serve as a meeting place for the multi-day hangout fest. What can you actually do in Anaheim? Drink? We can drink here! There is a lot more shit to do. For example, we could rent canoes in our backyards. We can ride bikes to downtown. There's a giant arcade just down the street. Plenty of attractive girls crawl off the rafters. They're not allowed though. Finally, our friends at Fudo.org have been gracious enough to offer their enormous headquarters for use in our event. We can party there and reminisce on the good old days of YouTube together. It's gonna be cheaper and way more fun than VidCon. So if you can make it, please let us know and we'll reserve a place for you. Hotel not included. And remember, this is top secret. So yeah, according to this DM, somewhere at some point in April, it was initially billed as the Kino Film Festival Birthday Bash, which, uh, you know, instead of a life culmination, suddenly this just feels like a birthday party bash for the YouTuber Kino Corner. It really just seems like they're partying off corporate dimes. That's it. They wanted to have a couple days of fun, festivities, and that was about it, all right? I don't know where the whole, like, Lightwave Festival really came into, but I guess we'll make an educated guess later. So to the guests, you know, who were invited, I guess at this point, or messaged, instead of going to KitCon, Glink, uh, and, and, and Kino in this case, and it, it's clear that this is a copy-paste message from Kino to begin with, to gather the coolest creators in their mind and bring them to the better city to serve as a meeting place for the Hangout Fest. Now, I'm really sorry what I leaked was top secret material, but I figured this DM shows the reality of what this actually was. It explains the lack of planning, and it seems to actually put this event into basically just being a place where people are going to get drunk and chill together. Now, what's important about this DM, most importantly to me, is the term, is, sorry, the organization, FUTO. 
Now, if you actually go to Futo's website, Futo paints a bit of a different picture. Futo is a new organization founded to develop technology and share knowledge that gives control of computers back to the people. You know, when we talked about taking back tech in the first panel for Lightwave, it really starts to paint a picture why a company like this would pay a bunch of influencers to influence people on what their company, like, I mean, if you actually look at the correlation, taking back tech, talking about cryptocurrencies, that's literally in this company's, like, company's values. So in fact, if you want to see about Fudo and its mission, you can go to their about page and find out that they're basically there built in from in-house engineering investments, technology that frustrates centralization and industry consolidation. What does Fudo actually believe? They believe in ethical capitalism cryptocurrencies, and of course, social media. We want to take back social media to the beginning of the internet, where creators would publish their works to the entire world. To bring this back, we want to develop tools and protocols for creators to publish directly to their audience without companies getting in the way. So again, it really seems like this company, who also says, don't be a sellout, we expect Futo companies to be fiercely independent. They should never exacerbate the monopoly problem by selling out to a monopolist. Capitalism only works when the winners compete with one another, which a lot of them do. We actually have laws in our government that prevent monopolies from basically building. That's why there's still larger companies. Granted, there's not a whole lot of larger companies, but there is a still amount of fierce competition between various sectors in the world. I don't know what this is on about, but hey, this is the company's beliefs, right? And of course, if you actually read through their website, you start to really get the idea that maybe Futo wanted to actually spread their message, their political message, their ethos, you know, through through a little through a little festival right <laughs> like if you actually look at the panels it lines up pretty well with this company interested in helping taking back tech sovereignty at our austin offices i think you get the point now of course uh, in another blurred message from our old friend kino it seems like multi-billionaire friends might have been invited into it so it really explains where some of the initial seed money was being given now of course Fudo did distance themselves away from the event shortly before, a week almost, according to Greg, where simply because I believe they actually saw what the event was and the complete lack of planning and they're like, we're out of it. Even if you look at what Lewis Rossman said earlier in the YouTube comment, he was literally disclaimed with, this might be a bit of a mess. So I think the writing was already on the wall and people who already gave their money realized they weren't getting it back but they can at least distance themselves as far as they can. You can even see how this invite was copy pasted again with Kino sending it to another guest. So again, this was not initially going to be the Lightwave Festival. This was going to be a film festival, something totally different. Seems really that it was going to be a birthday bash, okay? And they were trying to get like Alex Jones or maybe something on this with like a documentary premiere. Was Alex Jones going to be there? Because I heard that rumor. At some point there was an idea to have his upcoming, this upcoming documentary, Alex's War, be screened at, or premiered rather, at the event. That completely fell through. The plans all fell through until eventually it became Lightwave as we know it. And now, of course, you can identify when the plans fell through is when the guests realized that this wasn't just going to be a film festival, but it was actually going to turn out to be what it actually was, Lightwave Festival. Those that showed up showed up mostly to get paid, like Lewis Rossman, who again got a million dollars for his nonprofit. The posters that were slapped around town to attract any form of local attention are also worth taking a look at, where they actually mention other YouTubers that were going to come. Again, Rusty Cage, Michael Malice, and of course, CoffeeZilla, who later told me this seemed weird and he had no idea what was going on. Of course, this was actually at that point announced that it was in association with Futo. So again, this poster was before the actual event was going to like, before Futo actually, you know, dug their money out, before they dug their name out of this. Of course, another poster with more representative lists of people were actually going to show up, this time posted up on a wall somewhere in Austin to attract again the local attention. And of course, Futo got their name completely removed out of this, obviously when they probably saw that this wasn't going to be the perfect event that they have thought of, but of course, you know, what do you expect? Now in Greg's again defense over here, this was never going to be an event where tickets were sold. Everything here was free entry as always. And of course, I did talk with Greg, unfortunately that documentary was not recorded properly. So I know I made a mistake, didn't keep it, but Greg did say in his own words in the RFC After Hours interview and to me that he might've gotten better attendance if he just said open bar. And to that, I wholly agree. 
This wasn't an event that appeared to have months of planning put into it. Maybe the idea was formed months ahead, but the disaster itself was planned again, in my best guess, like 24 to 72 hours before it actually even happened. According to the planning phase, it seemed that Futo and the planners beforehand believed that this was more of a Greg fest than Lightwave, as the branding Greg initially planned out was going to be more focused on him than the actual panelists. Some people, we're calling this Greg Fest because Greg is on every panel for some fucking reason. Like, I, I don't know why. And I've heard that earlier poster iterations that Greg was doing had like posted by Glink and it's like huge text. And then it was small names of people being starred in it, like Ariel Pink, literally a an artist, a very known artist that had tiny text next to Glink. Even when it comes to planning things like PowerPoints in the backgrounds, that was last minute as well. Prox was the one who did them. One of the main events for day one that me and plenty of others were waiting for was Destiny, a very big popular political YouTuber. Supposed to show up on the panel and according to Greg, all of that fell through. Destiny did however show up for day two at the carnival. And, and Destiny did show up by the way, at day two, at the carnival, lightweight did carnival. He? he did, yeah, he did. Oh, I shook yeah. his hand. I confirmed everything with him and he, he won't tell you otherwise. I know he's honest enough to say that. Like if you ask him, he'll tell you, yeah, like, Something just came up, he couldn't make it. And that's what I'm telling you now too. And all for about 30 minutes, it seems. He showed up for about 30 minutes and I think played against Ice Poseidon in a chess game and then left with Ice Poseidon or Paul, you know. <laughs> okay. When Greg says he wasn't trying to compete with VidCon and he had no idea of it, according to the messages that Greg and Kino sent to various attendees, that is a clear and definite contradiction. It really seems to me the real story in this case was these guys partnered with a group that gave them seed money to kickstart a new convention for social media artists, gathering eyeballs and pushing their motives on the thoughts of taking back tech, cryptocurrencies, and of course, keeping all that dirty censorship far, far and away. Greg and Kino thought, fuck all this money, let's get to drinking and partying and all that sounds cool i guess birthday bash indeed until you actually have to do a whole event and organize that whole part you know the real boring shit the company sunk a bunch of money and once they realized that it was all gone they backed off and just wanted to be separated from the whole train wreck and that's really where it is i don't think the story goes even deeper than that to me this wasn't some crazy avant-garde success this in all realistic terms was a poorly planned out event you know, and for YouTubers, that's that's kind of setting the bar uh, pretty low, to be honest with you. I mean, hey, listen, at the end of the day, like I said earlier, at least this happened. Shit like TanaCon didn't even see fruition as far as I've seen. So to give Greg credit, at least he saw this through to the absolute end. Now, listen, again, you know, the event happened and Greg means well. And I don't think any of this is malicious to think that Greg may have done this to make some crazy money or clout wasn't really a thing. I honestly believe Greg is the kind of guy that really does believe this stuff deep down. And he actually wanted to have a place where artists and engineers came together. And you know what? In that respect, he kind of did succeed. And I got to give credit to a man that has his ambitions and seeks them out. I respect that to the ends of the earth. And I think anybody that kicks Greg when he's down or, you know, when he's making a fool of himself in, in the broader picture, isn't really giving, you know, isn't really giving the best term, I would say, right? Like the guy clearly, you know, had a, had a vision. I don't think it matched what he initially planned out, but hey, at least it came through to the end. The guy stuck with it, got to the end, and you know what? That's got to be worth something. Now, of course, Greg does in fact have a psychedelic history before we finish this video. And everybody, including me, asked him if he was at all high during the actual Lightwave Festival, to which Greg completely denies. Now, of course, Greg's psychedelic history has been building up in the last few months, where he's created such bangers like 10 Steps to Having a Good Trip, Ego tripping at the river of life. This is your brain on psychedelics. Now, I want to stop here and say that I don't share the same beliefs of psychedelics or drugs in general. I try to keep that stuff to an absolute minimum. I like living my life lucid and not under the influence of anything at all. But no judgments, all right? It really isn't that deep. But to me, on a personal level, after talking with Greg, I don't believe he was high. According to Greg, he was literally working his ass off 24 hours before the actual event. And I believe that, given I talked to Prox and various other people. 
The planning for this event literally happened in like the last 24 hours, most of it it seems. So obviously everyone was tired as shit the day of actually, you know, doing the event. I feel like this was done in an incredibly lazy way, and what started as a birthday bash grew into a festival bankrolled by a company to some extent to push some narrative, whether Greg agrees with me or not, and they pulled out last minute when they realized a train wreck that they were walking into. I mean, again, Lewis Rossman's message kind of confirms it as well. But again, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that Lightwave can be an absolute success if it's tackled on properly again. I would love to invest money into Lightwave 2 if we actually can get people that can plan such an event. Because the idea of having the unofficial VidCon gives me the vibe that when Mr. Beast makes something like YouTube Rewind, for the YouTubers, right? For the people in the group, for the people in the community. I genuinely think a place where YouTubers and social media personalities can meet in an open forum and have a discussion and drink and get together and have a good time can absolutely do well, all right? I absolutely will be down for an event like this. But in order to do this, all right, and again, to mention Creator Clash, for instance, you gotta plan these things months ahead of time. You gotta make sure your logistics are there. Because if you leave everything for the last two weeks, you never, ever going to have anything successful in this space. And ultimately, it creates a detriment for any other YouTuber going forward who wants to start any form of festival or convention down the road. Ladies and gentlemen, this is kind of like the fire festival in a way for YouTubers, right? Like to an extent. And in a way, it didn't have to be. I guess for next time, you know, take the mistakes and, you know, lessons that you can learn from this and make sure they're not repeated again far into the future. But hey, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I really have to say. This was an interesting little deep dive into like Lightwave Festival, a festival that most people, you know, probably didn't even hear of. I was hyped for it, I was watching it, and lo and behold, I guess you could say in some ways, it matched up every single expectation that I had. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.